说。Twelve point three geometric sequences. So there still is a pattern to recognize. The pattern, though, is different. With an arithmetic sequence, you're adding the same number every time. So there's a constant rate of change. With a geometric sequence, you're multiplying by the same number every time. So it's still a pattern to recognize, but it's not a constant rate of change. The rate of change is continuing to increase as the sequence moves along. So there might be a difference of 2 between one term, but then a difference of 4 between the next term and a difference of 8 between the next term. So the, uh, the rate of growth gets faster and faster and faster. What type of function have we seen where the rate of growth continues to get faster and faster? Exponential. Geometric sequences are modeled using an exponential type function. Very good. What did we use to model arithmetic? Linear. Linear. Okay, with arithmetic, we modeled it using a linear type function. So geometric So we've seen some of them before in, in section 12.1. Uh, we just didn't call them geometric sequences. Geometric sequences are modeled using an exponential function. So let's consider a sequence where a sub 1 is the first term. And r is the common ratio. If we wanted to list the terms of this sequence, the first term would be a sub 1. What would the next term be? If the common ratio is r, and the first term is a sub 1, a sub 1 times r. Yep. Really close, really, really close. The next term would be a sub 1 <laughs> times, r times r squared, yeah. So it would be like a n equals r n? Close. Keep going. You're really, really close. What's the next? Let's write a few more terms and you might see the pattern a little more clearly. a sub 1, what's the fourth term going to be? Our cube, remember this is the fourth term where n equals 4. This was the third term where n equals 3. Does anybody recognize a pattern? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so a sub 1 r times r to the fourth. So what I'm getting at is what is a sub n? Uh, equals r, a sub r 10 minus 1 r 10. It's the first term a sub 1 times r to what power? n minus 1. N minus 1. That's, the, that's the form of the equation for a geometric sequence. It's the first term times the common ratio to the power of n minus 1. Because if you see here from this general form of the sequence, the power of r is 1 less than the spot of the sequence it occupies. So this would be, what do we consider this? This is the implicit, explicit, recursive, what do we call this one here? This is the explicit. explicit formula. It's also called the nth term. If you're asked to find the nth term, that's what they're talking about right there. Let's practice this real quick. Example one. Sorry, we're moving super light speed here, but um, you guys keeping up okay? Fine. the nth term of the sequence 3, 6, 12, 24, 48. Bless you. 
Don't hold, haven't we talked about this before? Don't hold those sneezes in. I'm worried about you. The first thing you need to be able to do is recognize this as a geometric sequence. We don't even know if it's geometric. How can we tell? First of all, let's rule out that it's arithmetic. Is it, is it not arithmetic or is it arithmetic? Are we adding the same number every time? To go from here to here, we would add 3, but here we would have to add 6. Here we would have to add 12. So we're not adding the same number every time. Are we multiplying by the same number every time? Here we times by 2. Here we times by 2. There we times by 2. There we, so we're multiplying by the same number every time. That's repeated multiplication. This is a geometric sequence. What's the common ratio then between the terms? What's the number that we're multiplying by? 2. So r equals 2. That's the common ratio between terms. So then what would the nth term be? a sub n equals close. Three times two. It'd be the first term three times two to the n minus one. Now, you have to remember that you can't multiply the base with its coefficient. Just double check, though, to make sure this would produce these terms. If n equals one, that would be the first term. We're supposed to get a three out of it. Let's just make sure. If n equals 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. 2 to the 0 power is 1. 1 times 3 is 3. Would it give us, let's check to see if it goes, let's skip around here. What about the fourth term? Would it give us the fourth term of 24? If n equals 4, 4 minus 1 is 3. 2 to the third power is 8. 8 times 3 is 24. So that's the explicit or the nth term for that geometric sequence. Let's try part B. So I got to determine what type of sequence is it geometric, is it arithmetic? It could be neither. It doesn't have to be one of those two. We could just have a random list of numbers with no pattern. Okay. To go from 81 to 27, we can multiply it by a third. To go from 27 to 9, we can multiply it by a third. To go from 9 to 3, we can multiply it by a third. So the common ratio appears to be one third. R equals a third. So A sub n is the first term eighty one multiplied by the common ratio of one third to the power of n minus one. Getting the hang of it? A little bit. One more real quick, just for the sake of craft. Part C. trick you guys. Dang! Yeah, it's not geometric. We're not multiplying by the same number of time, but we are adding by the same number. 
We're adding by 9. So it doesn't have a common ratio, it has a common difference. D equals 9. So this was last time. It might not have had time to sink in yet, but uh, we're not going to use a, an uh, exponential equation to model this. We're going to use a linear equation to model this. In the linear equation, the common difference is D. So in a linear equation, that's synonymous to a slope, right? So A sub N equals 9N minus 11. Now where'd that minus 11 come from? Like the zero term. If there were a zero term, it would be the term in front of the first term. So it would be a negative 11. That's kind of what we talked about last time. All right. Let's try example two. The second term of a geometric sequence is 8. The sixth term is 1 half. Oh, man, this is a tricky one. Find the nth term. Whew. We did one like this last time with arithmetic sequences. The same principles apply for the most part. Bless you. Now, we know it's geometric, so it is going to have a common ratio. But because the sixth term is smaller than the second term, what does that mean about our common ratio? It's a fraction. Now this one may be able to be solved just by, by simple observation, but I'm, I'm going to show you the algebraic way because you may be faced with a problem that can't necessarily be solved just by simple observation. So you, you, do sh you should know the algebraic approach to this. Um, so list six blank spots representing the terms of the sequence. The second term would be an eight. The sixth term is one half. Now again, some of you may be able to just fill in the blanks and come up with this by observation, but let's let's figure it out the real way. Because we don't know what the common ratio is, let's call the common ratio let's call the common ratio R. To go from the second term to the third term, what do we multiply by? R. And then to go from the third term to the fourth term, what do we multiply by? R. And then the fourth term to the fifth term, you multiply by R. And then finally, from the fifth term to the sixth term, you multiply by R. You guys follow? So if we start with the second term, 8, and multiply it with four R's, R times R times R times R, what should that equal according to the sequence? It should equal 1 half. 8 times R times R times R times R should equal 1 half. This is going to help us figure out what that common ratio is. 8 times R times R times R. What's a better way of writing that? 8R to the fourth equals 1 half divided by 8. So R to the fourth is equal to 116. 
Take the fourth root on both sides. And the fourth root of 1 16th. You should know that. One close. The fourth root of 16 is 2. So R is equal to 1 half. So if you're multiplying by 1 half to go to the right in the sequence, what do you multiply to go to the left? Because we got to figure out what this first term is. You multiply by 2 to go to the left, so the first term is going to be 16. We need to know that first term so we can write the nth term. A sub n is equal to 16, the first term, multiplied by our common ratio of 1 half to the power of n minus 1. So that would have been the algebraic way to approach this. Some of you might have just noticed the pattern, which is good. But sometimes these patterns aren't always recognizable. Let's go on to partial sums. Specifically of geometric sequence. For sake of time, we don't really have time to cover the derivation or where this formula comes from like we did with arithmetic. So let's just go over the formula. Real quick though, do you remember, just because you are going to have to know this by memory, do you remember what the formula was for the partial sum of an arithmetic sequence? The first term plus the last term multiplied by half of the numbers that you're adding up, n over 2. Okay, that was the formula for the partial sum of an arithmetic sequence. Isn't that the pattern that we discovered? You take the first and the last term, and there's half as many of those pairs as there are terms of the sequence. So the partial sum of a geometric series, S sub n, Is that formula A, the first term, multiplied by the ratio 1 minus R to the N divided by 1 minus R. That's the partial sum formula for a geometric sequence. Evaluate from n equals 1 to 12. Have the sequence 1 times 2 to the n minus 1. Now, if worse comes to worse and you can't remember the formula, you could just write down all the terms of this sequence from 1 to 12 and add them up by hand. Might not be the easiest or the quickest thing to do, but if you can't use the formula, then try something else. Don't just skip the problem. So here's what I mean by that. What would the first term here be? When n equals 1, we have 1 minus 1, which is, which is 0. 2 to the 0 power is 1. 1 times 1. So the first term is 1. Second term is where n equals 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. 2 to the first power is 2. 2 times 1 is 2. The third term would be where n equals 3. 3 minus 1 is 2. 2 squared is 4. 4 times 1. 
So if we did write down all the terms of the sequence, we could do that and add them up by hand. What would the last term be of this partial sum, where n equals 12? What's the last term? Well, 12 minus 1 is 11, so it's 2 to the 11th times 1, so it's 2 to the 11. What is 2 to the 11? Well, let's go through some of the powers of 2. 2 to the first power we know is 2, then we have 4, then we have 8, then we have 16, then we have 32, 64, 128, 256. Now let's stop here. We have 2 to the first power. This is squared. This is cubed. This is to the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th. We're almost there. 1,024 to so the 10th power. So 2,048. So this would be 2,000. So if all else fails, I suppose you could just list all the terms and add them up by hand. But what if this had been out to from n equals 1 to the 40th? That would have been pretty tough to do by hand, right? So it, it is worth your while to be familiar with this formula. Let's, let's see what the formula would have said. That the sum of the first 12 terms is equal to the first term, which in this case is 1 multiplied by the ratio 1 minus four. Two. 2 to the power of n. And now n is the number of terms we're adding. So it's going to be what power? To so the 12th power <coughs> divided by 1 minus 2. Now what's 2 to the 12th? We know that 2 to the 11th is 2,048. So 2 to the 12th. It would be, be 4,096. So this is 1 times the ratio 1 minus 4,096 all over 1 minus 2, which is negative 1. 1 minus 4,096. Negative 4,095, but then you divide that by negative 1. So the sum of those 12 terms would be 4,095. So much quicker to use the formula, as I guess as long as you can remember the formula. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right here at the bottom? Because the formula says on the bottom it's 1 minus the common ratio. And the common ratio was 2 right there. Does that make sense? Okay. So is there a coefficient of A sub 1? It's A sub 1, yeah. It got covered up. It's A sub 1. It's the first term. I didn't want to spend too much time on that. I wanted to spend a little more time on this idea of an infinite sum. Yeah. The last number was 2,048. This, this would have been the, the sequence right there. All right, we have uh, 13 minutes to figure out how in the world we can add an infinite number of numbers together. So this one was for the 12th plot? No, this sum was for the, well, yeah, this was for the sum of the first 12 terms of the sequence. The sum of the first 12 terms. So if we would have added all of these together, it would have summed to be 4,095. I got a question for you. In your mind, try to imagine a running total of this sequence right here that we just did. Okay? If we're adding the, 12, the first 12 terms, what's the total going to be? 4,095, right? If we added another term, wouldn't the total go up? Yeah. Would the total continue to increase at a constant rate? Because wouldn't the next term be 4,000, which would make this go up to 8,000 roughly? But wouldn't the next term be about 8,000, so that would increase that? And then the next term would have been roughly 16,000. So the running total, if you're keeping track of the running total, wouldn't it continue to increase at a quicker and quicker and quicker rate? Yeah. So what if I had 1,000 terms of this sequence together, and I added them up, the sum would be pretty large, right? And it would continue to increase at an exponentially quicker rate. Mm -hmm. So. What would happen if I just kept adding and adding and adding and adding terms of the sequence? The sum would go crazy high, right? 
but consider a different type of geometric sequence. Okay. What if we flip this around and added the sequence 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth all the way as far as we could go? Isn't that still geometric? Or is it? Is it geometric? Are we multiplying by the same number every time we get to the next term? What would the common ratio be? So it is geometric. To go from 1 to 1 half, and then to 1 4, and then to 1 8, we're multiplying by half. So this is geometric, but in your mind, I want you to try to imagine what the running total of this sum would be. Okay? Eventually, if we got out to like n equals 2,000, what would the terms look like if we're all the way out as far as we could go in the sequence? These are questions that you guys can understand. You need to try to listen carefully when I'm asking. 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 sixteenth, 1 thirty second. What's happening to the terms? They're getting smaller. If I went all the way out to n equals 1 in a million, what would that term be? It would be extremely small, right? What would the 2 billionth term be? Even smaller than that, right? So we're continually adding smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. So what's happening to the running total? Is the running total increasing at an ever-increasing rate? It's still increasing. Because we are adding terms, but what's happening to the rate of increase? It's getting smaller and, it's smaller, getting and smaller, smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually, when we reach a high enough term, right, it would appear that the total isn't increasing at all. Because essentially, when we reach infinity, what is it that we're adding every time? Nothing. Right? The, the, I know this is a hard concept to understand, but... Eventually, if this, what are these terms approaching? 116th, 132nd, 164, 1, 128. They're approaching zero. Okay. So if we get a sufficient number of terms, eventually it would appear that that total it stops increasing because we're adding such a minuscule number every time to the total. Okay. So if we did consider all of the terms of the sequence, okay it would all add together to one single number. Okay, in this case, you said it. Less than two. What's 1.999999999 as far as we could go, essentially gonna be? It's essentially two, right? If we added an infinite number of this sequence together, it would be 1.9999999 with an infinite number of nines, which is essentially what number? Two. And that's what this infinite sum idea is. Even though it doesn't actually add to a number, essentially it would add, in this case, what would it add to? It would add to two. Okay? This sum is never going to exceed the number two. It's never going to get larger than two. This is what this is what you're going to study next year in calculus called a limit. You guys heard that idea before, the limit? This is the idea of behind the idea of a limit, which you're going to study. Um, what's the difference between this geometric sequence that does add to a specific number and this sequence, which continues to increase without bound? What's the difference? They're both geometric. How come? What's what's the big difference between these sequences? Why? You're correct, but why? What's the big difference here? Being divided, being divided. The difference is in the common ratio. What's the common ratio with this sequence? So each term is getting bigger by a factor of two. What's the common ratio here? One half. So each term is getting smaller. If the common ratio is less than one, that sequence has an infinite sum. Okay. If the common ratio is larger than one, that geometric sequence has no infinite sum. Let's write this down. We're, we're in the idea of an infinite sum. Infinite sum of a geometric sequence if the sequence
has a common ratio R where the absolute value of R is less than 1 then that sequence has <coughs> an infinite sum. Let me try to explain this another way. Consider a number line where we start at 0, and here's 1, and here's 2. Write this down real quick. We have just a couple minutes before the bell rings. If we considered that term, that sequence we were just talking about, 1 plus 1 half, plus 1 4, plus 1 8, plus 1 16th, plus 1 30 second, plus all the way out to infinity. Let's keep track of the sum on this number line. If I added the first term, if I started at 0 and added that first number, where am I? I'm over at 1, right? Now if I add the second term, where am I? I'm at 1 already. If I add the second term, where am I? 1.5. 1.5. Okay. Now add the third term. 1.75. Okay. Add the fourth term. Be about right here. Now add the fifth term. You'd be about right here, right? Add the fifth term. Or the sixth term, rather. You'd be about right here. What number are we never going to reach but get infinitesimally close to? We're going to get as close as we ever could to 2, but we're never going to exceed 2. That's why this is considered to have an infinite sum. And the number that this sequence approaches but never actually reaches is considered to be the infinite sum. Okay. Why is it that we're never going to reach 2? Is because we're going halfway each time. We're going halfway to the, to the end total. So if we're only traveling half the distance every time, we're never actually going to reach that sum. But we're getting infinitesimally close to it. Okay. Here's the formula for the infinite sum. It's really easy to remember. It's a sub 1 over 1 minus r, where a sub 1 is the first term and r is the common ratio. And write it again, even though you've written it down, write it again so you can see it twice, only if the absolute value of r is less than 1. The common ratio has to be less than 1. Is it just s or is it s sub n? Well, it's not s sub n, because n represents a partial sum. Since it's an infinite sum, it's just s. In calculus, you learn a word for this. This is called a convergent series. Just when you get to your calculus class next year and we talk, start talking about this convergence series, you'll understand what we're talking about. A convergent series converges to a single number. A divergent, what do you think divergent means? It continues to increase without bound. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but a convergent series converges to a single number. Like in this case, it converges to two. Let's see if this formula would have given us our sum that we were talking about. Okay, The sum would be the first term, which in this case is 1 divided by 1 minus the common ratio, 1 minus 1 half. That's 1 divided by 1 half, which equals 2. So the sum formula would have given us that infinite sum of 2. One more real quick. Example 5, I think. Where are we? 4. four. Evaluate
Now the dot 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 implies that we would be evaluating an infinite sum and not a partial sum. Now we first have to check that this truly is geometric. From term to term to term, are we multiplying by the same number every time? And is it a number that's less than 1? What are we multiplying by each time to get to the next term? 1 4. The common ratio r is equal to 1 4. So since the ratio is less than 1 and it's geometric, we can apply the infinite sum formula. So the infinite sum is the first term, 64 divided by 1 minus 1 4. So that's 64 divided by 3 fourths, which is the same as 64 times 4 thirds. Which is 256 divided by 3. So this doesn't divide evenly. So we can just leave it. You can, if you put 85 and a third, that'd be all right. But if you left it 256 over 3, that'd be fine. One particular type of problem that I've noticed gives students trouble is when it's in sigma form. So let's put, practice one of those real quick. If we start with n equals 1, and then I put an infinity sign at the top of that, what does that imply? An infinite sum. Okay, and then if I gave you the formula 27 times 1 third to the n minus 1, how do you know that we can use the infinite sum formula on this sequence? Because 1 third is the common ratio. Okay. This would be a geometric sequence where each term is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so the infinite sum formula would be S equals twenty-seven, because in this type of a formula, this is the first term over one minus the common ratio of one third, which is twenty-seven divided by Two thirds, 27 times 3 halves, which is 81 halves. So that sequence would all add, and the sum would approach 81 halves. It would never actually reach 81 halves, it would approach 81 halves and get as close to 81 halves as anything can get. So it converges, it's called converges to 81 halves. That's the infinite sum.